Hi, and welcome to episode 11 of Getting Creative with Lytro. We're your hosts, Andrew Sale, and the none other than the magnanimous Dave Zaboski. Hey, Dave. Hey, hey, Andrew, it's good to see you. <laughs> Happy to be here. It is good to see you again, your bright shining face. It lets me know that we are uh, where we need to be. Um, this is the show that's all about the collaborative crossroads of marketing and brands and the creatives and storytellers that they work with. Um, we've been getting some amazing feedback from you all about the show. And so first of all, first and foremost, thank you. Um, thank you so much for the kind words. Um, but we'd also love to hear from you about who you'd like to see on the show. Uh, and so if there's somebody that uh, maybe you're a marketer um, and you say, hey, I have something that I want to contribute to the show. You've got expertise. You've been in this world. You've been in this industry and you want to raise your hand. Hey, we would love to hear from you. But if, if you maybe know a marketer or you know somebody who's in these industries and you want them to be on the show, just tag them in the comments so that they know to come here and let us know that we want to that you want us to talk to them and we can we can chat them up because uh, the more the merrier. Right, Dave, we want to continue right, I mean, to learn. <laughs> That's exactly it. Like we're, we're, we're a couple of creative guys who are here to learn. Like how does marketing work? What's the day to day? How do you get better creative from the creatives? We're on the creative side and I got a ton of questions for you. So yes. let's, let's figure out how we can uh, bring more creativity into the world and get more creative. And yeah, we're here to learn. So if you we got information, help us. Yeah. Let, let us yeah. know. Um, and we, we will reach out and we will, we will set up a time to chat. Um, but today we are joined by somebody who is no stranger to the marketing world. Uh, we're talking with copywriter James Hart. James has worked in several facets in the writing world from journalism all the way to the editing room. Um, and after completing his creative writing master's program in Australia, he moved back to the US and has worked on projects with folks like Bicycling Magazine, CBS, and US News and World Report. Um, we're going to talk with him about his story and we're going to get to know his work, but we're also going to talk about what the future looks like for writers in a world where AI and chat GPT um, are really gaining ground. So before any of that, let's get to know the guy who is self-admittedly funnier in retrospect, James Hart. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, welcome James to the show. Yeah, welcome. <laughs> no, <it's Hi>. <laughs> How's it going? We are doing well. How are you, James? That's the better question. Yeah, doing really good. You know, the weather's starting to brighten up a little bit, so it's good to go outside um, after like a back and forth kind of winter. So doing well. Awesome. Well, here's what we want to do. We want to spend the next few minutes getting to know you. Uh, we want to talk about your work, but we have to start at a baseline, right? We have to start with who James is. So give us the Wikipedia page about who you are. Okay. Well, um, I have been doing the writing things for uh, quite a while, and that's meant uh, very different things, um, you know, over the years, I guess. I, I started with, like, editing and journalism, and then, you know, I started shifting into uh, marketing and um, doing a lot of uh, content writing. Now I do a whole lot of uh, copywriting, and um, that's primarily what I'm working on now, but it's uh, – just anything word related is, is kind of what I do now. And, um, you know, it's uh, how it sort of was kind of funny. I, I didn't uh, initially go to school for it. I had an environmental science degree. And so I was uh, I worked as a, as a scientist for like a year or two before I started uh, getting into writing. Oh, wow. So it was a bit of a, an early shift. Yeah. <laughs> We, we were talking a little bit before the show started about some of the why that you're here, you know, like what, like, mm -hmm. like you love words and I, you, you've, your career has kind of crossed a bunch of disciplines from journalism to copywriting to marketing, uh, which are really kind of different things. Like if you're a swimmer, one's breaststroke, one's the butterfly, one's the, you know, the, the crawl, like these are different disciplines. What is it that you feel is like at the root of your calling to be able to use words to describe the world? Yeah, it's, it's mostly uh, stories. And um, basically every single facet of, of what I've worked on, it's basically telling some kind of story. Um, I, I think stories are, are really important. They're, they're how we really relate to one another and, and ingest information. Um, we, we tend to learn more from stories than, than facts do. And, you know, it's just a very old part of who we are. And that, um, that got a hold of me really... Uh, really early on before I knew I was going to be doing it for a living. Um, my last semester at school, I was finishing up my uh, bachelor's for environmental science and I had a gap 
between when an old, uh, uh, my, my rent was going to end and I was going to start living somewhere else for my last semester. And at a buddy's place, he did not pay the electric bill. So um, <laughs> it was really hot in, I think it was like uh, early August before like semester started. And I couldn't plug anything in. I had nothing to do. So I went to the library. And um, I didn't really, you know, a lot of other people who work in the writing discipline, they have a good story about how, you know, they've always been in the writing. They used to, you know, write things when they were uh, when they were kids. I read a lot. I wasn't a big writer. I kind of got by in my English classes. But um, when I went to the library there, I, I picked up an Isaac Asimov book. My dad mm. was a big Isaac Asimov fan. And it was called The Early Asimov. It was uh, the, the first stories he worked on. And I had this, like, crazy moment, um, you know, that Stephen King talks about a lot. If, if you ever become a writer, you've probably had this experience where you read something and you're just like, you know, this isn't that great. Um, you know, I could maybe, could I do this? I, I, well, this got published. Like, how bad would my first ones be? And so when I started working um, with uh, my environmental science degree, uh, at night I was just, I was writing short stories. And just, you know, um, I'd stay up way late just uh, working on my own writing. And it became just like this compulsion. Um, you know, I just, I wanted to get better. And it turns out, actually, my, my first stories were terrible. Like, they weren't, they weren't <laughs> that great. But I, I loved doing it. And I got so much out of, you know, uh, reading the work of others and what they were trying to do. And it just, it, it got me hooked. And who, who um, were, Oh, sorry. Yeah. Who were some of your, some yeah. of your, your other storytellers? I, I heard a, a quote once that said that stories are what got us out of the trees and into the libraries. Um, oh, but who were some of that. your other, your other storytellers? Oh man. So, um, you know, I, I had a big, because my dad taught astronomy, so he was big into uh, science fiction. So I, I grew up reading, uh, you know, Douglas Adams, Robert Heinlein, um, a lot of the old school stuff, Carl Sagan. Um, and I, I loved all of that. Uh, now, you know, I, I got into, um, well, we'll get to when I got my master's. I, I, I'm big into poetry now, too. And I love narrative stories. Um, you know, uh, that's why I, I'm a big Robert Frost fan, too. Um, plus, I mean, he, he talks a lot about the environment. I'm, I've always been big into the outdoors, too. So I kind of resonate with that. But, um, you know, uh, I, I have a big love of movies, too. Um, I, I love, uh, I, I love movies of any and all types of genres. It's, you know, uh, my tolerance for what I'm willing to watch is a lot greater than my wife's is. She's a really good sport because, you know, it's, Hey, let's check out this weird thing. And, you know, she'll, uh, she'll, uh, you know, um, she'll go along for the, she'll run. be a good sport of it. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So it was really stories. Nice. And, and I, I, I want to ask, uh, apropos of what you just said there, you know, I noticed in some of your, your posts, like there's this, um, there's this distinction between being a gourmand and a gourmet. In French, it means like the gourmand is someone who just eats all of this stuff. And the gourmet is someone who tastes it and figures out like, what's the recipe in this? Does this have a little tarragon in it? You know? And I noticed that like, um, that you you play that role on both sides a little bit, like how to watch a Super Bowl commercial, but also like how to see like what's truly going on in these things. Where where when you say like you consume movies, where do you land as a storyteller on that you know gourmand or gourmet? Can you turn it off and and just say I'm going to enjoy this, or do you kind of go oh there's a story point or that's a thing you know like how does yeah. that work for you? I cannot turn it off, at least for me, you know, I, I'm always thinking about, you know, how something was made and just like the, the nitty gritty of, of, you know, just how the storytelling works. But at the same time, you know, it, it doesn't take away from my enjoyment of it, you know, um, even when it, it, you know, you watch movies that aren't really necessarily all that great. They might've been hyped a lot, but they kind of are lowered in your expectations. I can still have a lot of fun with it because I can see what they were trying to do. And, you know, uh, you guys would know this a lot more than I do. Like, movies are hard. They're, they're really hard to make and, and produce. And so, um, you know, I can see the effort for, for what it is. And typically, like, uh, you know, I always learn something from, from watching them. Like, so I can't help but nitpick and, and look at sort of, sort of the, the how they did it and what they were aiming for. But um, it doesn't detract from the fun for me. It actually it, it makes it more enriching to see it from that way. Do you do you feel like when you're when you're dissecting things that way when you're when you're 
critiquing is maybe a little bit more of a, an industry word for it. But when you're dissecting and, and critiquing these um, these films or whatever it is, the, the writings that you're taking in, the, these different media, do you think that comes from having a, a science, like a, a upbringing of a, a father who was into science and who was an astronomer? Do you think that plays into it? Yeah, I found that um, in the writing world, probably in other creative industries too, uh, people approach it from maybe two different spots. There are very analytical people, and they can sort of learn to leverage their analytical mind to kind of learn the nuts and bolts of of how the writing might work. And then you have intuitive folks who just, um, they kind of train their ear for, you know, what works and what doesn't. I definitely started as an analytical person. Um, That's just kind of how I was wired. But after... You know, with a lot of practice, um, you know, I'm getting better with, with the intuition side of things. But um, at least for, for me personally, I, that's my natural tendency. I, I tend to uh, focus on kind of like uh, the nuts and bolts of it. But uh, I, I think other people, they can just kind of more intuitively, they might not know, uh, be able to articulate it as well, but they get the vibe of something very quickly, um, especially with uh, advertising and marketing. You know, some people are just very good with getting the right tone. Um, right off the bat other people kind of have to work at it but it's kind of two different ways of approaching it yeah that makes sense yeah you and you so i want to ask you too like you you've been a journalist and a copywriter and those seem like two really different disciplines Mm -hmm. um Mm -hmm. how how would you how, how would you define the two of them and um how do you make the transition between you know each one yeah in terms of definitions, um, at least with uh, with journalism, uh, I think it's a misconception that, uh, you know, journalism is like, you know, just the facts, ma'am, kind of thing. And I, I don't necessarily agree with that because um, there is some interpretation that, that has to happen with something. Uh, you know, a journalist has to go in and find out what a story is. You know, they refer to them as stories. Mm-hmm. And so um, when I worked with, uh, you know, I start, started doing – um, you know, my own articles. Uh, I love the fact that, uh, what was the line from, uh, I think it was the paper, like every day you always start from zero. And I love that. I, I love not knowing what the story was and having to get all the relevant facts together to figure out what this means. And for, for another audience, what does it mean for them? Um, with uh, doing marketing work and, and copywriting, it's more like um, you have a story that you want to tell But you don't necessarily know right off the bat what would be relevant to the audience. You have to learn about them and just how does the overlap happen between their needs and the story you're trying to tell? Like, how does this help them? And so driven by curiosity at the core for each side. Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, the more I feel like the more you know about um, your audience, the better off you're always going to be. I harp on that a lot. On, uh, on LinkedIn, but with journalism, if you know your audience better, like once you get new facts about a story, it's like, oh, well, this is really important. People need to know this. And with the, uh, the copywriting side of things, the more you know your audience, the more you can help them. And, you know, that, that's how I view it. And just like telling the right kind of story so that they understand what you're about and that, you know, how you can provide a service to them. So, yeah, it's very much that. So both of them come from a, a, a place of research, but how does that transcend? Do you do any, um, do you do any fictional writing? Do you, does that transfer into any sort of like, uh, you know, telling us like a fictional story, not trying to meet people where they're at or trying to share someone else's story that would be more journalistic. Do you try to ever take that to that next phase where it's based on fiction? It's based on something that you're creating in your own mind. Sure. Um, I have a, you can't see it, but I have a stack of stuff here I'm currently working on. Like I, I've been working on, uh, you know, uh, my own, uh, poetry for a while. You'll see that creep in with some of my uh, LinkedIn stuff. I can't help but to write poems here and there. And I like uh, working on, on narrative poems. And um, with that, like things that are like creative writing, you kind of start with, instead of what does this mean for the audience or what does this mean for the people you're trying to reach, I sort of ask internal questions like, what does this mean for me? And then I try to express it in a way that could be understood by others. But I have to start with, well, what do I think this means? Because I feel like I can't write about it effectively if, if I don't understand it first. So it's, it's kind 
kind of um, solving my own puzzles, but then, you know, polishing it up in a way that I can share it with somebody else. And there's a, there's a communication that can happen there. Yeah, but, I um, that, oh, oh, sorry, I was just gonna say, I always feel yeah. like, like really powerful art is the creative's way of connecting so deeply to themselves that it starts to resonate outwards. Yeah. And the the poet David White, uh, I think is really interesting because he's doing a lot of corporate work. So it sort of relates in a way to the, what, what you're talking about. The, this idea that, that poetry is a language that allows for two things to exist at the same time that most other language uh, systems don't. Right. So like mm -hmm. you can have in and he talks a lot about bringing poetry and the language of poetry into the corporate world, because the corporate world really has this like um, a B system, like, you know, two things that are in opposition can exist in the same place at the same time, whereas in poetry they can. So his take is that that uh, um, corporations have the power, but they don't have the language. And poetry has the language, but it doesn't have the power. And so if you could bring more poetry into the corporate world, and I think that is a little bit where copywriting lives, mm -hmm. then you mm -hmm. have the opportunity to create something that that allows for an evolution. So an evolution is a place where there's two things that exist at the same time that may be slightly oppositional. Um, and so I think that that's what's what I, I love that you're in in poetry as well as these sort of more technical kinds of writing. Yeah, and it, uh, it's not unheard of. Um, you know, the poet laureate for California, uh, Dana Joya, I think he was the first poet to be president of the NEA. If he wasn't the first, he was, you know, one of the few who became president of NEA. Um, he was a, uh, I think he was a vice president of marketing for the General Foods Corporation, but he's also a poet. And so um, he's been very serious about, uh, you know, advocating for creative writing, especially for local communities. And he's done a whole lot for um, his community to just sort of, uh, you know, uh, let people understand that, uh, you know, poetry is, it's not still relevant. It might even become, you know, more relevant as, you know, I think our need for uh, good stories being told and, and sharing stories becomes more, more important. Well, and poetry is such a broad, I think, people have such an, uh, uh, a mindset of what they think poetry is. And we've put poetry in a box. At least for me, growing up, poetry was always just da-da-da-da-da, 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 right? Like that's what, you, that's what you learn growing up. And of course you learn that there are different uh, methods, but poetry really transcends all, by, by definition, transcends all definition, right? Like it can be yeah. the ultimate expression through words and that's really it and the the form that it takes the method that it takes is really um really doesn't matter uh it, it's to the poet uh who's expressing it to decide whether or not this is a a piece of poetry or a piece of journalism right like it's for the person who's creating it to to determine that um you've worked for companies like cvs and like we said like the um world news and things like that. How have you, how have you worked that voice into your professional, um, more, I would, I'm going to do air quotes here, serious writing. How have you worked your, your poetry bent and, um, your love of creative writing into that? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, especially with, uh, copywriting, uh, there's always the problem of space and time. You know, you're, you're very often uh, trying to relate to an audience who doesn't necessarily owe you anything yet. You have to earn their trust and attention. And so you have to very quickly get to the point, um, you know, provide something that's of value to them first and foremost. And so it's um, it's really similar. I love uh, the word game aspect of writing. I, I love working with constraints. And the constraints are different, but the types are, are kind of similar, you know. How to uh, how can you relate to somebody very quickly? How can you write uh, something that's very impactful, but very clear and easy to understand, and just you know um, direct, clear communication? And so the aims are a little bit different, but you know um, the ultimate goal is the same: uh, having a clear impact with your audience uh, in a very efficient way. And so that's really helped me a lot with um, with uh, the copywriting side of things. Um, uh, what really helps with that too, is just, uh, again, knowing who you're talking to and kind of where they're coming from, from their end, the more empathy you have for your audience, 
the mm-hmm. easier it is to, you know, write something that's impactful for them because you're putting, you know, their needs at the forefront. And so that's really kind of, uh, you know, a quick hack, I guess. If you're trying to write something that, um, you know, resonates with more and more people, get to know who you're trying to communicate with more. Right. Empathy, intuition, creativity, human characteristics. And there are tools now um, that are less than human, but that may also be um, pretty effective in this space. I suppose if that's all right, maybe we wander into some of those waters here. Let's let's wander into the uh, the uncharted territories of artificial. Is it artificial intelligence? Um, Dave, you have you have a good setup for this, um, so I'm going to let you lead the charge on this because you've been behind the scenes in in our personal conversations. You've been kind of carrying this banner for the last several weeks on like where do we live in this space? How how do we feel about it? Where are we really at war with ma- with the machines, or is there a harmony to be struck? And so I'm going to let you kind of uh, lead us into those waters. Well. All right. Yeah. I mean, I've been thinking about this for a minute here. Um, I I actually wrote an article in 2016 about artificial intelligence. Um, And I got to tell you, I still don't know where we are. Um, You know, it's it's confusing. James and I, we we, uh, and Andrew, we were talking just before we started, like um, it's moving really fast. Three weeks ago, I hated it. Two weeks ago, I was like, "Eh, okay, might be work workable today. Not so sure again. Tomorrow, I might love it. It's, you know, there's an article I just read about the research that's going on at Stanford where um, in 2018, the first chat, chat GPT uh, tested the same as about an eight-year-old in uh, the theory of mind and its sort of cognitive understanding of things. And then now it's at about a 12-year-old in about, you know, two or three years, and it's an exponential acceleration. So, so it, it, you know, it has surpassed me is what you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> well, exactly. Yeah. We're now, um, it is now cognitively stronger than Andrew Sale. Okay, cool. Yeah. Good okay. Well, um, uh, uh, but it doesn't have as nice a smile. So, Thank you. And that's, you know, I was just fishing. I was fishing. Yeah. There go you on, go. Dave. <laughs> um, so it's moving pretty fast. You know, in a couple of years, it'll probably have this sort of theory of mind or cognitive development of a college student. Um, where it can follow Kurt Vonnegut's seven rules of how to write and all of these things, but can it break those rules like a college student, you know? And so I think that, that, that there are some interesting spaces. Uh, I'll sort of just leave you with this. We've been told that there are kind of three choices with AI. The first is to constrain it, which you might see in places like military or government. The second is to collaborate with it, which we are probably doing, um, did we lose James? I think we did. I hope I hope he comes back. Looks like his All screen right. froze. We're just going to banter for a second, Dave. We're just going to vamp. That's what we I'll call stop, it. In the I'll, biz. I'll stop on number two. Yeah, we'll stop. Um, we'll stop with number two, uh, and we'll hope that that James rejoins us in a moment. Um, in the meantime, right. uh, I, I do want to. <laughs> I just want to say the technology is fantastic, but clearly it's not complete. It knows it knows we're talking about it. That's Ooh, the thing. That's what happened. <laughs> Dave's about to lay some truth on AI. It's, if my uh, screen goes out, then we know there's something going on. Yeah, which, if it is, then I'm kinda. I've already got a go bag. <laughs> I've got yeah, a go bag. Just, I'm ready to head to the where, hills, my friend. Where are you gonna go? <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna shut my phone off for sure. I, I, I know that for sure. Yeah. Um, I, I am interested, Dave, um, while we while we wait for James uh, to come back. I'm interested about your um, perspective on on working with writers because you're 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 trained as an animator. Right. You worked as an animator with Disney for for many years um, and you were working to express the writing that these that these writers were doing. How how did that relationship work um, between you and the writers room? Well, you know, the, the, in the same way that it does with an actor and a writer, you know, we as animators, we were sort of actors in slow motion, like 24 drawings a second, but we still had a performance to deliver. And so, you know, you had the sound of the actor that voiced it, and then we were the sort of physical embodiment of that performance. Um, it, it's an incredibly collaborative process, as James was saying before the AI took him out. Um, uh <laughs> that, that uh, it's hard to make a movie. 
And so there are all of these really interwoven collaborative process to, processes to it. Um, you know, we're a little bit more constrained because we get the, the final take. And so we're using that final take to create from. So uh, my freedom is in, well, he might move like this or he might move like mm -hmm. that. So I'm really the mime behind the, 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 the dialogue. Um, and in smaller productions, there really is a, a, a back and forth. The writer comes up with an idea and then it gets storyboarded. And you might say in writing, and they sat by a lovely sunset descending on the horizon, right? But then you can draw that and you don't need to say that anymore, right? So the right. picture paints a thousand words. And so there is this real ping pong match, this sort of back and forth to look at uh, where can you eliminate the, or, or maybe make more eloquent those words so that the images and the words balance each other. And I think we see that in sequential work, in comic books, in, uh, in copywriting, in, in a lot of different places is that, you know, we're, we're pretty visual. So how do we create that balance between that, that dance, between the word, the image and the feeling it, it is supposed to engender? Yeah, I want to be I want to be sensitive to the idea that it is a a full on collaboration, right? So it's not like there's one who is the um like it's not one person writing right doing everything and then the other the other parts are writing coattails. But would you say there's a a ratio um spent to how that how a a great movie comes to fruition, right? How is there a ratio of uh it's uh, seventy percent this, thirty percent this. Is it like is there is there a a magic number, um, or is it truly fifty fifty when it comes to to how you um, how you find the right balance for this? Well, yeah, I don't think that there's a magic formula. The director generally has the vision, and so that's who's driving it. But then the director hands things off to the cinematographer, to the to the uh, to the storyboard artist, to the art director. You know, um, uh, the three-time Academy Award-winning uh, cinematographer Conrad Hall is a friend of our families, and I talked to him once about it. And and you know, he would have his assistant set up a shot, and he go, "Well, I want this to feel like this." And then they would set up the shot, and he would look through the lens, and he go, "Yeah, that works." You know, <laughs> is he the cinematographer? Is it like so? There's this like handoff, this trust that happens in this kind of spiral of creation where you're constantly handing something off. The only real formula that I've ever heard is Sergio Pablos from um, Sergio Pablos uh, animation. He did the Minions and Gru and uh, Klaus and he's really extraordinary. Oh, yeah. um, uh, really doing beautiful, beautiful traditional and CG work out of his studio in, in Madrid. And uh, he says, and I can't remember exactly what the numbers are, but the, the one formula that, that he goes by is that a movie has to have 35 laughs um, uh, two cries, one for sadness and one for happiness, and then a great big awe wow. or something like that. Right. And so like, that's kind of his formula. And if you look at Klaus, like, I, you know, I don't know that you would go, Hey, this needs to bump up the laugh a little bit. I think at things at places like Disney, when we brought the gargoyles in to Hunchback of Notre Dame, I think we were trying a little too hard for something like that. Okay. But there is this, this kind of science to story where you are looking for sort of a chemical reaction that that has a sweet to it, you know, like I'm intense and I'm curious and oh, then I'm relieved and then I, you know, I get my yeah. serotonin and my dopamine. And so there is a, a, a kind of process or science to that storytelling. There's um, an algorithm, it sounds like. There is a, uh, well, it's an algorithm of story, if you will. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. not just movie making, but it's how stories work. You know, it, and it's um, why songs don't work if they're just one note, right? Like if it's just one note over and over and over again, at, le at least it needs a second note so, so it has something to counter. Um, right. Well, I think, it, you know, you, you hit on something exactly. If you look at like symphonies, for example, they have movements to them and they start with, say, a lanto, you know, or a, a slow movement at the beginning. It kind of pulls you in, but it's it's containing some of the themes that are going to be present later on. You know, you can think about a symphony as a story. And then those themes sort of emerge with more and more um, vivacity as the as the the symphony carries on. And then there's this denouement, this kind of um, in French, that word means uh, to unknot something. And so 
uh, there's this sort of untying of things and those those uh, themes resolve. So wait, is, and, is on that idea, though, is is the idea that everything starts as a knot and the idea of it's kind of like with uh, with Michelangelo, right, with he saw he sees the, the person inside and he just chips away until that person is revealed. Is it like that? Oh, I think we got James coming back. We in. do have James back. Yes. All right. Um, and so, uh, yeah, bring him back in and we'll we'll answer that question. Hi, James. Hey. Speaking of technology not working very well for you. <laughs> yeah, Skynet took you out there. We were just about, yeah. so we decided that we're not going to talk about AI it's, at all. It clearly is. Don't make it angry. What happened? Um, don't, yeah, don't, don't make it angry. Don't poke the bear. It's, it's um, all right. And it that bear is spelled B A I R. Yes. <laughs> it's, um, it, it was okay. We we had an opportunity to to uh, to to gain a little insight from Dave. So no no issues. We're we're good to go. So back on that topic, Dave. You why don't you set us up again? The one and the two and the three. All right, great. So the, so so um, so yeah, with AI, um, uh, basically there's sort of three choices that we've been told we have. That one is that we can constrain it, like I said, in in military uses or government uses, where we don't want the AI to go Skynet on us, right? So we have some constraints on its choices. Um, we can uh, collaborate with it, which is what a lot of the things that are happening now with ChatGPT and Dolly and Midjourney and those things. Um, or we can defer to it, which is what a lot of stuff happens also, where you just sort of do a prompt and then now I've got a book cover. Um, and so constrain, collaborate, or defer. And I wonder if there is a fourth choice. Like maybe that fourth choice is we choose not to use it because of the process that that allows for that intuition that you were talking about, that allows for that, that creativity and that poetry. You know, there are benefits to the toil of creation that allow for an emergence of new ideas rather than just a regurgitation or an amalgamation of the collective, uh, um, I don't want to say intelligence, but the collective product that humans have dumped into the internet. But it is an interesting, it is an interesting landscape that is being developed. And I'd be interested for you as a writer to understand how you see your mm -hmm. present and potential future with a tool that could facilitate, but also uh, eliminate a process by which the things that you love, poetry, intuition, and creativity come about. Yeah, um, I guess I'll, I'll start off by saying uh, I have no idea, um, you know, definitively, like where we're going. And, um, you know, I'm as curious as everybody else, I suppose. I guess we're all trying to navigate this together as, you know, new developments happen. But I'm kind of reminded of, uh, I was talking to my advisor when I was getting my, uh, um, my poetry master's. And I was kind of like downtrodden about the fact that, you know, like Andrew said earlier, like poetry is kind of in a box and how it's not really reaching out to people as, as well as it, it could. You know, you used to um, see new poems published in newspapers and things. And now, you know, newspapers are online. You don't see it a whole lot. And he just looked at me, kind of laughed. He said, look, you know, poetry's not going anywhere. And I was like, what do you mean? He said, it's, you know, it's old as the hills. Um, you know, it's, it's older than written language. And so um, it's going to be around for a really long time. New manifestations of it will be interesting, but it's a lot more resilient and malleable than you think. And so I think that's where, I mean, we have been um, kind of working with human stories and storytelling and relating to one another through, through stories for such a long time. I really don't think that's, that's going away. It, we have such a long track record of that as, as people, you know, before we started writing things down, we were telling stories. So um, I think it's going to be a matter of, yeah, we will use new tools. Um, it's kind of like, uh, you know, we do have fast food restaurants now. They're very fast and, uh, you know, expedient. And um, they do get the job done. But fast food restaurants haven't taken out, you know, fine dining experiences. Mm. That, that, that's a way to look at it, too. Mm. Um, like so just in terms of new technology replacing, you know, how we used to do stuff, I think it'll augment it, not really replace it. And I think one thing we will be really starved of, especially with Dave talking about, you know, how these tools as they are now just kind of aggregate what, what it's been able to find in terms of source material. We're going to be starved for human connections. We're going to have, you know, just so much choice in terms of where we give our attention to. 
And there's going to be so much content to relate to out there. Finding something that really speaks to us, you know, it's like, uh, what did um, uh, Ray Bradbury say? You know, what do you do when you look for, uh, when you go into the library? You're looking for yourself. You want to pull a book off the shelf and say, here I am. And so, you know, I think it's really similar just in terms of human connection. So to the extent that these tools will help us find ways to still tell human stories, I think we'll be fine. In terms of people who use it as a shortcut to just, well, I want it to do all the expression for me, I think that will work in the very short term. But I think we're going to get tired of that kind of communication pretty soon. Right. No- Noam Chomsky is 94 years old, and he said that he had this insight around AI, uh, specifically the, the art-making uh, tools. And he said, people say, hey, this stuff, is it, it makes making art easier. And his take is, it's actually not about making art. It's about avoiding making art. And I thought that was really interesting that, that you know, you use these tools to create images and the images are pretty stunning. They're pretty spectacular. Um, and they're not made by someone who went through the process, who had a lot of discovery, who, who um, you know, they're, they're a way to avoid making art. And I thought that was pretty salient. I, you know, I, I, I may... I probably won't use AI because I love the process, but I do see that it is a tool that can facilitate a lot of what it is that we do. It being void, being void of human expression. I don't think there's going to be any level of um, artificial intelligence that's going to be able to bridge that gap. Uh, Regardless, like at the end of the day, there will always be some disconnect between man and machine or human and, and machine. Right. And I think what you're saying is, is a, a pretty, pretty interesting insight because I, I didn't think about it for in, in the terms of, of fast food restaurant versus like fine dining, right? There is something to be said about, yeah, you can go and have someone on, I don't want to disparage anybody or anything, but like you can go have someone create a logo on Fiverr, or you can go work with some of these people who have intrinsic knowledge and understanding of brands and marketing and what it takes to communicate a message and have something that's tailored just for you that does exactly what you need to do and tells your story. Those are very different things. And there is a potential place in the market for both of those things. It just depends on do you do you want Taco Bell or do you want to go sit down and have a five star meal? Right. There's a there's a difference there. Um, that's a it's a unique perspective that I hadn't thought about before. Um would you consider using? Um, would you consider ta- it's like tapping into and, and utilizing AI to help you in like um, practices, like when you're running any sort of practices to give you maybe to generate prompts for you or anything like that? Is that something that you've considered as uh, as a tool for the writing process? Yeah, I, I've been messing around with with ChatGPT a little bit, and um, it, it's interesting because already, I mean, it's only a couple months old. People are using it for for different things. And how people seem to talk about it is if they're talking about it in a positive way, they like the fact that it takes the thing about the writing process they don't like off the table. Some people, um, you know, it's the nuts and bolts stuff of just like fleshing things out and like that's what they're getting to help with. For other people, it's the iterative process itself, just coming up with, for example, a social media post or things like that. I actually love every part of the writing process. And so um, I, I really like the hard work of it. Um, so I, I've been messing around a little bit with with um, really just uh, ideation a little bit. And it helps in terms of it, the more you work on a project, the more you tend to get tunnel vision because you're kind of staying within the same parameters yeah, a lot. Yeah. And so um, for me, it's kind of helped me on, on a very uh, high level just like – take a step back for a little bit, like, you know, here are maybe some things like you haven't considered. But in terms of, you know, the, the writing itself, uh, I don't think it's quite there yet. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, who knows? I mean, it, it, it might get that way. But, um, you know, at, at least for me right now, it, it's really helped me, like, see things from slightly different perspectives. But in terms of, you know, just going in and, you know, um, from a marketing perspective, understanding your audience, figuring out what resonates with them the most. That is not something at this point that chat GPT, GPT can really help with. Um, you know, probably after a while, it will help us with some of our research too. But, uh, 
you know, there's nothing like, uh, you know, just the, the old school method of just talking to people, figure out what they're about. So I, I think, like I said, it, it's going to augment, you know, what we used to do, not necessarily replace it, at least um, at least in the short term. Who, who knows in the long term where we're headed? Well, it's accelerating and it's getting better at what it does. Though I think that a signature matters. And I think what you're saying, too, is that a deep connection also matters. And so maybe that's one of the upshots of it is that it does become kind of fast food or it offers a, um, a, a shortcut to the place where you actually then have to do the real work, the human work. Yeah. Quick service versus yeah. full service, right? Like like what, what you can get, uh, you know, a la carte versus a full experience, a full dining experience, I think is a I mean, great way to think about it. We're, we're still a long way from what they call general artificial intelligence. You know, I mean, the neurotransmitters for the human brain have, I don't know, 100 billion connections. And we're, that's like a, a 100x away from it where we are right now. So even, even uh, you know, the self-driving vehicles, it's not really that possible right now. Like if a leaf falls in front of your car, is it a leaf? Is it a cat? What kind of cat? Is it a calico cat? Is it, a, you know, like the, the AI just does not have the variations to understand what's going on there. And so we've seen some some promises that aren't fulfilled. And I think that we're in this kind of honeymoon space right now where it's like, oh, it's going to take care of everything. And then, you know, we're, we're there's just a lot of hype around it. And I think that there's a, you know, some turbulent waters that, that will settle as we start to figure out what this tool really is. Yeah. And James, you said something at the, at the, at the, the top of all of this stuff where you were saying that you, um, this is like built into you. The, the idea of writing and finding story is built into you. Um, can you just take, can you just take a moment and, and express what that means? Like uh, communicate what that means that this is built in. Like you look at it, Bianca said in the, in the comments, she said, sometimes the experience gets lost in the sauce. Sometimes we just do enjoy creating something for the sake of itself not for the end result, but simply for the process. And you said something similar to that. I don't remember if it was in this conversation or if it was just before we started recording where you talked about this being innately in you. And this is a part of just who you are. What does that mean when it comes to writing yeah. for you? Well, um, I've had a lot of questions, you know, just about where uh, my career trajectory might go, especially with uh, the advent of, you know, new AI technology and, you know, um, I'm asking like, you know, is this really for me? Is this something I, I should be doing? The interesting thing is um, if I'm working on a project and I might not know which way to go, you know, there might be a couple different options for things I could present. I get excited because then I'm allowed to do like all three, you know, that's what excites me the most. And whatever happens from that, I'm not really as excited about finished work. I mean, it's always nice to see like the fruits of your labor and like maybe even to get recognition. But for me, where it's at is, is the making of it. And, you know, just really uh, using that to sort of connect to people. And so, yeah, just, just last night I was working, you know, pretty late on a project and like, you know, the subject matter could have been considered like, you know, a little boring, maybe, you know, not really appeal to everybody. And it was really just nuts and bolts stuff looking at, you know, just fine tuning like the editing stuff. And I was thinking about it and I'm like, you know, I think maybe most people would, would hate this. You know, I'm just sitting in like, you know, my uh, my kitchen table alone, just doing this tedious work. But I, I love doing that. You know, I love working on writing. And b basically with me, with, uh, with stories, um, basically all kind of writing communication, you're trying to convey some kind of a story. You're trying to relate to somebody or, you know, a lot of times with, with storytelling, I, how I see it is you're kind of taking somebody on a trip, you know, you, you have some stuff over here. You, you want them to see your experience and for them to go over to meet you where you're at and then to, to, to come back, they've, you know, learned something from that process, even if it's something as fast as looking at a billboard. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I think that's so important and that's just something that enriches me always just working on that process and just sort of paving the road, uh, the road out for different routes that people can go and something they can learn. And so for me, like, um, uh, that's the part of it. If I can find tools to help me, you know, do that maybe a little faster or get me new insight about how to do it better, that's, that's yeah. great. But I, I would never want it to be a replacement, you know, of that process. Yeah. And I also don't think it would work. We, we want to relate to, you know, other people more than we do 
something that was, you know, put together kind of sure. artificially. We, we want to see the people behind the message. Yeah, I think that's that's a perfect um, a perfect point to this idea of collaboration. Right. You um, you are a writer and you're you're in your house right now or you're in your, your office, you're in your studio, where, wherever it is that you do your work. Um, and uh, like a lot of people right now, they're doing work remotely and they can do it from wherever they want in the world. Um, however, there's a downside to that, which is isolation and isolation can can creep up on you and isolation can kill creativity. Uh, and so uh, tell tell me uh, about the or tell us about the the importance of finding community to help build those things and, and bounce ideas off of and um, find that connection so that you can actually uh, build in yourself so that you can pour out in your work. How important is community to you and where are you finding that? I couldn't do it without that. Um, it's, it's so essential to the process. It, it's, it's so essential um, because I find if I'm not, um, you know, there's different kinds of uh, collaborators, collaborating with, with team members, and, um, you know, that's, that's one thing. And I like, one thing I, I like doing is, is talking to people who aren't writers themselves mm -hmm. and just like, well, what do you think of this? And I won't, they might not have like the, the background to tell me why something doesn't work or anything like that, but their expression and their emotional reaction tells me everything I need to know. So, um, that's really helpful. But mm -hmm. in terms of other kinds of collaboration, I find that if I don't read a whole lot, you know, if I... I'm kind of stagnant with like, you know, watching new films, like checking out um, other creative work from other uh, agencies, like just some cool ads that I've seen. If, if I don't do that on a regular basis, it's really hard for me to write. I, I don't um, I don't feel like uh, I have anything that uh, is inspiring me so much. And so just um, seeing, you know, uh, I think creativity inspires creativity. And so, you know, just getting that kind of charge from other people and what they do is really important too. But, um, you know, it sounds it's, like, it's, it sounds like one of your practices is to continually resource yourself. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, you know, and a lot of it's not too one-to-one, -one, you know, I get a lot of inspiration from music too. Just, uh, you know, um, things I'm listening to. Uh, I stole my, uh, my dad's old, uh, records. The last time I went down to visit him in Florida, so I had to get a, a record player, play those. And just um, some of the, uh, you know, some of the lyrics, too. It's like, well, they don't write like that anymore. And that's an interesting mm -hmm. turn of phrase or whatever. Um, movies, too. Um, you know, there's obviously a lot of stuff I like to read. But uh, just learning from others, you know, ads can, can do the trick, too. But um, I, I read a lot of graphic novels, too. And I love graphic novels because oh, it's mostly an illustration. And there's such an economy of space with the words that you really have to get the words down properly. As um, a fan so, of sandboxes, yeah. You, yeah we were you, talking yeah. a little bit about that when the AI took you out. Yeah. <laughs> um, do, do you have a, like sketchbooks or notebooks or journals where you capture? Like if there's something that, that you go, oh, that's a jewel, and that you pull on it? Do you, 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 uh, you here's do. one. Here's another one. Here are <laughs> a couple more. So, so no is your answer. <laughs> right. no, so no, as a pro. Uh, As a pro, you have at least four different journals within reach in this very moment. That's yes. great. At any given yeah, moment, so, he, can, he can grab four different uh, capturing devices. I love it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and they're all they're all themed. I, I stopped like it became a mess just having one notebook, and it was just I couldn't make heads or tails of like what I wrote down a couple weeks ago. So they all have like loose themes. So you know, it's uh, my own personal writing that I'm working on. Um, cool ideas that I saw other people do, um, like uh, neat campaigns that I thought, man, that was a great idea. Um, uh, just lists of stuff I want to check out, you know, uh, books, movies, albums I might want to check out, those kinds of things. So, yeah, I have at least four running around. I think there's like one or two more like somewhere else. But, uh, yeah, that's that's constant because I know if I don't write it down, I'll never remember. Yeah, Bianca so, here says approximately 11 T journals. 11 D, yeah, 11, <laughs> 11 D journals. D. Yeah. Um, and beyond yeah, seem to be so 11 she, dozen. She knows because she's a writer that she's she's in the same boat as you. I've I've heard it said uh, from a friend of mine, you can't pour out of an empty cup, and you are constantly having to fill your cup um, as a creative as as anybody trying to put anything out into the world. You're having to fill your cup, and it sounds like um, you're filling it up with all sorts of different flavors from different faucets from different places um, to to hopefully. Uh, become an amalgamation of of all these things, and so you can put something new that is wholly 
original and wholly unique um, based on all these different inputs. But I do have to ask one question, as um, as philosophical as that all sounds, is one of your notebooks in your bathroom? Because if it's not, I think you're missing an opportunity. <laughs> uh, uh, right now, right this second, maybe not. Um, otherwise, like it, this one carries me everywhere. Like I, I find it in all the rooms of the house. Like whenever I just happen to be working downstairs, upstairs, somewhere. So on any given week, yes, it could be in the bathroom. Uh, right now, it happens to be beside me, but don't let that for you it, it, it's it found it. everywhere yeah that okay. sounds great hey james what does the future hold for you like what's a perfect project for you to work on and what do you see as the like the sort of aim for your career you have a lot of fiction you've done a lot of work in a bunch of different uh disciplines what what sparks you now and what's the light that you're heading for um you know it uh, I, I guess looking back on the stuff uh, I've worked on already, um, it's really just uh, I, I like uh, trying to use uh, storytelling to solve interesting and important challenges. So, you know, that's really what, what lights me up really well, um, especially new ones, you know. And the nice thing is things are changing so much uh, so fast that uh, we're going to have no shortage of uh, new challenges to, to overcome. And so I like being able to, you know, use my my writing ability to just kind of you know work on that i love trying out new possibilities and like i said just ways to connect with people and so um you know ideal projects for me are just um you know working on things i haven't necessarily uh worked on before trying to learn uh more about uh people i might not have connected with before and um trying out uh you know trying out new things you know i, I love the the novelty aspect of just trying out a new project and so um, I'm trying to keep things kind of uh, high level and uh, general right now just to see how things unfold with, you know, all these new technologies that the nuts and bolts of it, you know, it's kind of hard to see that far out of how it's going. But um, I suspect I'll probably be doing what I've always, you know, been doing, just uh, maybe using different tools or in a different context. But there's going to be an element of just connecting with, with people and just trying to tell good stories. That's, and that's, that's, I think the key to what all of us are trying to do. Right. Um, tell everybody where they can connect with you, where they can follow what you're doing. They can, they can track the, the work that you're putting out there and, um, uh, and, and just be able to, to see who you are and follow you. Uh, yeah, mostly LinkedIn. Uh, I, I hang out on there like, uh, quite a bit. So you, you'll see my updates there. That's probably the best way to get a hold of me. Okay, well, thank you uh, so much for chatting with us. And it's it's important to say in all of this, James, you're part of the Lytro community, and this is one of the places where we are trying to um, cultivate the the connected creative community. That's what we're all about um, at Lytro. And so, um, thank you for contributing to that community. Thank you for being a part of that. Thank you um, for for caring about it. <laughs> it, it. A lot of a lot of this stuff is is very much resonating with who we are. Um, and thank you for, for being a part of that. But if you want to be a part of um, what um, is happening within our creative community, if you want to hang out with people like James or James specifically, because he is in that community, you can head on over into uh, lightro.com slash four hyphen creatives um, to get that process started where you can submit your um, your portfolio and get it looked at and um, be part of our connected creative community. Or maybe you are a marketer and you want to work with someone who's like James or James specifically on a project and you need some copywriting done and you need your story told Head on over to Lytro.com to begin that conversation with us uh, there. Let us collaborate with you. Let us help you um, tell your stories with world-class artists, creatives, illustrators, writers, um, producers from all over the world doing this thing. We really are a connected community from all over the world. It's a global community of super talented people. Um, but you can start right here uh, at Lytro.com. Um, James, thank you again for being a thank part of so this. Thank you so much, James. Really appreciate you being here. Seriously, like uh, you're thank a you rad, dude. Even though the technology tried to get to, to take you out of our lives, we're not going to let it happen. Thanks for pushing through with us. Yep. And uh, thanks for pushing through if you um, if you were watching online. But uh, for now, we're going to hop out of this episode. Until next time, hey, everybody, let's get creative. <laughs>